My name is uh, Jack Herney. I'm on the board of the LitFest. And uh, as we all do um, on the board, we do everything Renee tells us to do. And that's why I'm sitting here this afternoon. Um, I'm also a former faculty member of Phillips Exeter Academy, taught history for many, many years. And I'm going to be talking particularly about the political activism of James Monroe Whitfield. And our other panelists will introduce themselves and then we'll get underway. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Courtney Marshall. I use she, her pronouns. And I am currently um, an English teacher and associate dean of advising over at Phillips Exeter Academy. Um, I have been at the academy for six years. And before that, I worked at UNH as a professor, of, assistant professor of English and women's studies. And before that, I was at UCLA getting a PhD specializing in African American literature. Um, so when I'm not um, going to tap dance class at Adagio or teaching Zumba Gold for free through the Parks and Rec department, um, I'm usually reading and writing and thinking about reading and writing black. Literature. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Weber. I taught English at the Academy for a long time, and after I retired, I started um, taking leads from Barbara Rincones at the Historical Society and from Renee, who not only created the Lit Fest, but Renee's the one who rediscovered James Whitfield. And um, it turned out as the birthday approached and Whitfield became the centerpiece of this event, that there was a, a funny kind of accidental, uh, what I hope will be a, a, a kind of serendipity. I had been studying his uncles, um, not knowing that, I just I wasn't really oriented toward Whitfield. The more I read about him, of him, the more caught up in it I get. Um, so I thought that I mean, my role today is mostly as a kind of preface to Courtney talking about the poetry and Jack talking about his activism. Um, I thought I would share a few things that I think are related to where his poetry comes from and things that um, should be interesting for readers of his or listeners of his um, to know about as they encounter the poems. So I thought I would start with a kind of 50,000 foot national piece that will take about 12 seconds and then come down closer and closer to Exeter and to his family um, and see if we can connect some dots. So I grew up in Connecticut uh, assuming that racial issues were mostly Southern, um, certainly slavery was Southern, as far as I knew, discrimination was Southern. I really had no clue about what the landscape actually was that he was, that Whitfield was born into. He lived in a time when the number of enslaved people in the American South was going from about two million to about three million. So on the verge of the Civil War, there were about three million people enslaved in the South. And there were a few hundred thousand people, black people, who were free, some of them in the South, many of them in the North. Uh, and the North was not the promised land. So that even, um, well, right. Um, the North was a place full of racial hostility not so much violence, really. Um, there was some, but not you know, nothing like on a southern scale or what became the southern scale later. But um, there was job discrimination. There was discrimination and segregation in public tra public accommodations, public travel. One of Whitfield's remarkable uncles, Thomas Paul, was a Black Baptist minister who had been invited to speak at a church in Salem, and he went from Boston uh, to Salem, preached, went to the stagecoach to go back to Boston, and was told that 
he couldn't get into the stagecoach because there were white people in there and they didn't want to ride in a stagecoach with black people, with any black person. But he was welcome to sit up on the bench with the horse's reins and the driver if he wanted to do that, which he declined to do. Um, the biggest surprise to me in poking around that early history was, first of all, what, what slavery in, I was going to say, in New Hampshire there were 150 slaves in 1790. There were two in Exeter at that point, but before that there was a much deeper uh, involvement in enslavement, even in our state. 1767, 187 enslaved people just in Portsmouth several hundred in the state as a whole, and then it, it, slavery itself drops off in a big way. But um, it's one thing to end it as an institution, and another thing to transform the culture that sustained it. And that isn't something that gets done with the same speed. I thought it might be interesting to, um, I, I found a, I'm trying to get down to the ground now from the overview. Um, by the time um, we start the 1800s, slavery is almost gone in Exeter. And one of the last slaveholders had his will probated here in 1802. And I found the text of, the, uh, of his will kind of remarkable in, in the way that it opens outward into uh, different things that we're going to be talking about today. So I thought I would read about eight lines from this and you'll, you'll see what I mean. You'll see in the tone and the language. I, Josiah Robinson of Exeter, after humbly recommending my soul to the mercy of God through the merits of Jesus Christ, and my body to a decent burial in hopes of a blessed re resurrection, my worldly estate I give, desire, devise, and dispose of as follows. I give and bequeath to my beloved wife, Sarah Robinson, the use of our part of the dwelling house in which I now live, and 20 feet of the west end of my barn, and my household goods during her natural life. I give her also $60, which is maybe 2000 now, to be paid her yearly during her life out of the estate. I also give her the use of two good cows and two sheep. My son Jeremy shall find and provide for his said mother as much firewood as she shall have occasion for. And I also give to my said wife, my Negro woman, Kate. So the world in which Whitfield is born and begins to grow up and then has to function on a local level, uh, even here, is a world that sustains that way of thinking. Like himself, he being someone who I think, the more I read, the more I see how exceptional and how emblematic he is both, even though that's perhaps a uh, paradoxical thing. The same was true of his family. What I'm um, trying to transition to now is how Whitfield is connected to slavery personally, even though he's living in a town where there isn't much of it left anymore. But it's not only still here in terms of the cultural, uh, the residual cultural underpinnings, it's here in a more intimate way as well. For one thing, his grandfather began life um, in slavery. His grandparents' oldest daughter, Rhoda, married June Hall, whom some of you will know about already, um, who had been enslaved before he spent seven years in George Washington's army uh, in exchange for which he received his freedom. So Whitfield and, and uh, Whitfield's own father, Joseph Whitfield, was himself an escaped slave who had been born in Virginia and came um, first to Newburyport and possibly to New York and then in any case here. 
So Whitfield is connected in that personal direct way to slavery, not just through national statistics or through some kind of um, broader empathy with black people in the country generally. Um, he had an enslaved grandfather, an enslaved father, and an enslaved uncle at different times um, in their lives. His, his grandparents had nine kids, so Whitfield had four uncles and four aunts. And the fate of that family illustrates the complexity uh, and the range of possibilities that he was <coughs> encountering in his life and that his poetry is grounded in. One aunt had three sons, all of them born free in New Hampshire, who were lost into slavery. Two of them never heard from again, and one, after 10 years, escaped, made it to England, got a job uh, in the coastal uh, marine world, and was able to write to his parents. So the father of those three boys, having fought for his own freedom and for the country in George Washington's army for seven years, had the experience of losing three sons into the condition of life that he had thought he had escaped from. On the other end, he had, Whitfield had, so those guys are his, um, his first cousins, they're the sons of his mother's sister and brother-in-law. Another of his first cousins stays in Exeter and gets rich. She married a very enterprising new arrival in town who turned out to be tremendously talented as a, as a carpenter and as an entrepreneur and as a um, buyer and seller of land. Um, and he made a lot of money and when he died, she had another 30 years to live and she became a kind of a figure in town, a main benefactor of the integrated Baptist church. Um, and then sort of, I guess he, no, no, start that sentence over. He had three uncles, three of his four uncles. The fourth one crashed and burned, I'm sorry to say. The record I found only uh, criminal records for him. But three of his, the other three of his uncles become national and international figures in abolition and in what you could call Black agents, really, they all they are all the founding ministers of Black Baptist churches in, in major cities, in Albany, uh, in New York, where the church has become a city in Baptist, uh, and in Boston, where Thomas Paul was the founding minister of what is now the Afro African American Museum. Um, Thomas Paul became legendary as, in the as an effective Baptist preacher in the northeastern United States, preaching to and converting white people as well as others, as well as people who look like him. Um, and Nathaniel Paul, um, in 18, Nathaniel Paul founded the Black Baptist Church in Albany. Am I going to, did it go to two more minutes? Yeah, right. Nathaniel Paul is, I think, the guy that James Whitfield is channeling more than anybody else. Um, and I'll, I'll try to explain that in a minute, but let me tell you first what, what he did. Um, in 1827, New York abolished slavery, not until 1827. I say parenthetically because of the language of the will that I read, that in New York, if you were a, a married woman, you could not own property in your own name until 1851. Anyway, in 18, um, that was an aside. In, in 1827, um, New York abolishes slavery, and Nathaniel Paul gives a famous address about that, celebrating the emancipation of formerly enslaved people in New York. Um, and also saying in a way that anticipates Whitfield, I think, if I knew that slavery was not going to be ending in, say, the middle distance anyway, if not before then, I would be an atheist. But he's speaking as a black Baptist minister in the spirit of believing that it is going to be ending, that it's clearly 
um, contrary to the will of God, that there should be slavery, especially race-based slavery, but really any kind of slavery. So Nathaniel Paul gives that address on July 5th, which, as many of you will know, um, was a, a kind of rhetorical device that Frederick Douglass picked up on in his famous speech, his famous July, July 5th speech. Nathaniel Paul did the same kind of thing. I, 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 you know, nobody does exactly what Douglass does in terms of language and rhetoric, but. Nathaniel Paul is pretty good, and he did the same thing 25 years so Douglas, in advance. So Douglas is really going to school to Nathaniel Paul uh, when he gives that great speech. In 1833, Nathaniel Paul um, goes to Britain and travels with William Lloyd Garrison, who has uh, revolutionized the anti-slavery movement in the United States the year before, 1832, 1833. Um, and they go all over the British Isles, excuse me, speaking to huge crowds, drumming up um, enmity to slavery in the immediate foreground of the abolition of slavery in the West Indies by the British Parliament, which happens in 1863, while Nathaniel Paul and Garrison has come back by that time. Nathaniel Paul is still doing that work and is being increasingly credited with having had something to do with the parliament getting to that point. 800,000 enslaved people in the West Indies were no longer enslaved by the time he came back to the United States. I'm not saying if he did anything like all of it, there was a, a, you know, a, a British abolition movement of long standing. What connects all these dots for me is, especially after listening to Willie read America the way he did, um, is how much anger there is to negotiate if you're um, born into this kind of society with racial um, hostility and contempt and discrimination at the levels of their work. And how would there not be anger? And then you have to make some choices about what to do about that. And um, several different kinds of strategies emerge, which tend to divide black people at the time, because the problem is so hard, as we all well know. Um, the problem is really hard to solve. And you can see in the voices of their prose writings and their poems, um, decisions that they're making about where to, where to go with that, whether it's manageable, and if so, how. So I was struck at the end of Willie's reading where that poem begins with, you know, as a kind of indictment of the country that he's speaking to. Um, by the end, there's something more hopeful and gentler going on. Whitfield um, has another poem called How Long? And in that poem, instead of addressing the country, he, he addresses God directly. And it's, um, it's there's a kind of, um, I don't know if I quite want to say there's an edge to it, but um, he's quite clear with God that he's not happy with um, the way things are. And then it becomes, so he, he, he goes through a kind of um, bill of complaints focused on slavery. And then at the end, he comes out in quite a different place. So I, I think there are a lot of different um, levels and tones in his poetry that make it um, multi-dimensional as a reading experience. And uh, it's also just strong. It's an interesting voice to have in our libraries now, I think. That's great. Actually, um, what uh, David ended on, uh, you're going to see personified in one person, namely uh, what he was talking about, how uh, the, uh, the various uh, avenues that people saw uh, and engaged in uh, in dealing with slavery, uh, Whitfield did that um, because he changed his mind about the proper way to deal with all this in the course of his life. Um, and it's appropriate that we heard about 
um, Nathaniel and the uh, uncles and their work, um, as this book says, um, uh, Whitfield's work had important sources in the inspirational work of his distinguished family. Um, it must have been uh, well aware to Whitfield um, because the community of abolitionists and so on uh, was a close one. It must have known what his antecedents had done before him. Okay, we know that uh, James Ron Whitfield was born over there on what is now um, Elliott Street, was Whitfield's Way, 1822. Um, he was born in a town, Exeter, that had the largest free black population in all of New Hampshire. Pretty remarkable. Uh, we don't know exactly why, but it, it seemed to be a magnet for uh, soldiers who had obtained freedom or had served, black soldiers who had served in the Revolutionary War. And there were 83 uh, free blacks in um, Exeter in, in 1822. Moreover, in some ways, this, the town was uh, quite um, integrated. Uh, the, the short amount of schooling that Whitfield had, he was probably only schooled until he was about nine years old, was an integrated school right over here on Spring Street. We know that he probably left schooling about the time he was nine years old because sadly his mother died when he was seven, his father died when he was 10. And at that point, the family, um, we think, moved, brothers and sisters, uh, moved from Exeter. Uh, but before then, uh, he had uh, experienced life in a town where, though there were certainly elements of slavery about it, there was also a vibrant community of, of free blacks. We know also that he not only got his uh, education from the school on Spring Street in 18, I love this, in 1854. By this time, he has written poetry. He's well known around the country in abolitionist circles. In 1854, the Exeter Newsletter decides, let's talk about our native son here. So they publish a, an article in which they say he was the son of Exeter and the town library, <laughs> which suggests that he probably got a lot of his education there as well as in the school. We know that he left here and wound up by the time he's 16 in Buffalo, New York. And more remarkable than that, at age 16, he leaves Buffalo and goes to a convention uh, in Cleveland, the African American Convention at 16. Not only does he go there, the convention decides to write some resolutions at the end of it, and he is one of five people who draft those resolutions at age 16. Think about what you were doing at 16. <laughs> I know what I was doing, and it wasn't drafting resolutions. But he obviously was well-educated by then. Um, that begins his career in political activism. Actually, he's in a good place to do it because Buffalo is a hotbed of um, anti-slavery abolitionist activity. It was probably because of its proximity to Canada, and therefore it was the last stop on the Underground Railroad <coughs> before freedom. So people went there. Right after he um, is involved in that convention in uh, 1838 when he's 16 years old, he also writes in um, the uh, in Buffalo. Uh, he writes a petition and and signs a petition agitating to free slaves in Buffalo, and he also writes a uh, helps to write a, a resolution that's passed by the Buffalo community to grant uh, the vote for um, blacks. So he is clearly in the forefront of all uh, abolitionist activity in Buffalo at, at that time. Um, and the, it's the appeal to the citizens of Buffalo, uh, which he is, um, um, which he is um, signing and drafting. Um, this would place him, uh, and here we go back to what David's theme was, this would place him in the camp of Frederick Douglass, who believes that, look, 
The Constitution can be used to free slaves. It's not what William Lloyd Garrison thought it was, a pact with the devil. No, you can use the Constitution to bring votes, to bring freedom. It's going to take some time, but let's work within the system. So he finds himself allied with the likes of Frederick Douglass. That would put him opposition to people like uh, William Lloyd Garrison, who also want to free slaves, but he's going to do it through, in his view, disunion. You can't stay in this country under this Constitution because it allows slavery. So he wants to effectively abandon the South and simply have uh, the Union of the North where there is more freedom. Um, Buffalo, as I said, the hotbed. Another example of that is in 1848, there's an organization called the Free Soil Party, which comes to be their first national convention to nominate a president of the United States is in Buffalo, New York. And uh, interestingly, by this time, this is an outgrowth of the Whig Party, which had been the dominant party in the 20s and 30s. And that disintegrates, and out of it comes the Free Soil Party first, and that will become part of the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln. In 1848, the only free soil senator in the whole United States was a New Hampshire senator, um, uh, John Parker Hale of Rochester. So um, we know that uh, Whitfield attends that convention. We know that he meets Douglas there, that he meets a man named Martin Delaney, and Delaney believes not in sort of what Douglas believes, but he also believes that probably we're going to have to get out of this country. We're going to have to emigrate someplace. And they're all allied in opposing what's known as the American Colonization Society. This had been established after the uh, Revolutionary War in the, in the 18 teens, because people were so afraid of all those free blacks, like the ones in Exeter and so on, had grown from about 70,000 by the 1820s to hundreds of thousands of free blacks in the North. And they were afraid that these free blacks were going to be a beacon for slaves in the South to revolt. So the best way to prevent that, Southerners thought, was let's get them out of the country. We'll colonize them in Africa. So all of the abolitionists were opposed, including uh, Whitfield, to the, uh, the Colonization Society. However, emigration was something different. So at this time, um, our friend Whitfield is between his friend Douglas, who visits him in his barber shop, that's his employment in Buffalo, New York, visits him, and this is what um, Douglas says about Whitfield. By now, he's written poetry, and um, our friend Douglas has read it. He says, that talents so commanding, gifts so rare, poetic power so distinguished should be tied to the handle of a razor and buried in the precincts of a barber shop is painfully disheartening. <laughs> Come out of that cellar, Douglas writes, and let your bugle blasts of liberty careen over our northern hills. You are employed to do this by your enslaved and slandered people. So he believes that uh, certainly uh, Whitfield can be an ally of him, of his. But in fact, now Whitfield begins to leave the Douglas camp and move to the Delaney camp of emigration is the only way that we can uh, solve the problem of slavery. Why? Because probably the the Compromise of 1850 has just been passed. That enshrines the fugitive slave law. That means that not only fugitive slaves, but some uh, freed blacks will be uh, costed as slaves and sent back to the South. He begins to lose faith that the Constitution can solve the problem. This is the kind of thing he says. This is Whitfield now moving from Douglas, a black patriot in this country must be more fool than knave. The fact is, I have no country. Neither have you, and your assumption that you are an integral part of this nation is not true. I have no faith left in the justice of this country. So there you have a guy going from Douglas, working with the Constitution, 
to let's get out of the country. He wants to not go to Africa, but he follows the, the direction of Delaney and others. One of the United States congressmen at this time proposes that the Congress um, set aside monies to buy property in Central America and South America. And what are they going to do with that property? Free blacks are going to go there establish what they will see as a prime example of the best kind of country. It will show all blacks in this country, including slaves, that blacks working on their own can establish the best kind of civilization, better than the civilization of the United States. It will be a beacon. So that's what he puts his mind to. And all through the late 1850s, he and Douglas have a, an exchange of very caustic, not well caustic, but uh, aggressive uh, challenges to each other. One for staying within the Constitution, the other, let's get out of the country. But then the Civil War comes, and Whitfield says, wait a minute, maybe if we can get rid of the South or destroy slavery, this goes back to a point David says, remember, his uncle championed emancipation. Maybe if this war brings about the end of slavery, we can stay here. And in fact, when the Emancipation Proclamation is uh, established in 1863, January 1st, Whitfield comes back to the fold of, we can do it in this country. And he says, let's empower blacks to serve in the Union Army. Let's uh, follow Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. And in fact, four years later, on the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, he gives an address celebrating how far the country has come. It has ended slavery. So by the end of his life, which ends in 1861, he is back believing in hope. The terrible things he said that I quoted, he has decided to abandon. He believes that there is a future in this country. So that, in one person, shows how the, uh, the different ideas appear manifest in a single individual. And now we'll hear a little bit about how all of these ideas uh, can be viewed in his poetry. Y'all all right? <laughs> Good. Good. Um, so first, I, I want to say thank you to Renee. Um, I love birthdays, celebrations, um, and for the past few years, I myself uh, have celebrated Audre Lorde and Toni Morrison's birthday on February 18th. I believe very much in um, if there is a writer that you love, um, find out when their birthday is and take that day to read their work, um, share their work, um, be in community with others, like really make it a celebration. Um, and you can start by getting this book, right? And you can find lots of poets um, poets in this book. It's also National Poetry Month, so another great um, reason to get um, involved in, in poetry. And just in, in creating the, the celebrations and the commemorations that you want to see, right? We always say, um, you know, kind of think, what is the kind of world I want to live in? If you want to live in a world where writers like Whitfield are celebrated, you can do that. You can you can be that. Um, I also think it's cool because I live on Elliott Street. Now, so that's also very nice. I I never think that um, anything happens just by coincidence. I always believe that you know everything has already been written, and I just follow along where Black people send me. And so I live on Elliott Street, and so that's pretty cool too. Um, so I'm I'm, I'm just going to talk really briefly just about America and just some responses to hearing hearing it, hearing um, Willie read it, which was a wonderful reading. I was like, I really felt the, the force um, of, the, of the poem. Um, so I want to say just a, a, a few things that I got from this poem. And I, and I will only talk about America because that's the poem that we, we heard. And to me, it would be right to go talk about other poems that y'all are like, what is she talking about? Because I can tell you anything and you'll be like, yeah. That's right. But now if I say something, you can like walk over to the, the side wall and be like, actually, Courtney, that's not what it is, right? So we always want to we always want to do that. Um, so a, a couple things. One, I love um, 
what was shared earlier of, about the direct address to, to America. Um, in my own research, back when I was writing my dissertation, years and years ago, I, I was writing about um, black women writers kind of thinking about criminality and how the term of criminal was used against um, black folks. But what I see here in Whitfield's poem is he actually starts out with this line, um, the land of blood and crime and wrong. So he locates crime, he locates wrongdoing in the country itself, right? So then, for those of us reading the poem, even today, right, we, we can continue to think about how does a country act in criminal ways? And as citizens, because certainly he, this is a poem that's not being read by enslaved people, right? They're not reading this poem, right? You have to decide as that reader, are you gonna be on the side of criminals, right? Or are you gonna be, which I think he does really well here, is are you gonna be a patriot, right? So when, so I think when Willie started us thinking about kind of why would you do direct address? Why do we constantly have black writers, in this instance, black poets, trying to tell America, like, be what you say you are, right? Be a country of your word, right? Follow through with all the things that you say. Let your actions match your words because to do otherwise is to be at best hypocritical, but at worst criminal, right? Um, so you really have to decide kind of where, where you're gonna stand on that. He also asserts, in the, the speaker in this poem, asserts their right to be in the country. So, so we see um, phrases like my native land, Right, he's um, there's a uh, two lines. He says, um, "From whence has issued many a band to tear the black man from his soil and force him here to delve and toil, chained to your blood, be moistened sod, cringing beneath a tyrant's rod." And so it's a really interesting move that Whitfield does there, where you start out with this black man who's been torn from Africa, right, torn from his soil, and is now. In on this American soil, so he's he's not of the soil, right? He has been transplanted from one um, one to one place to another. But then, as we go de further down the poem, and he uses these um, this figure of war, right? So he says, "When black and white fought side by side upon the well contested field, right?" And then it says, "And wounded side by side they lay and heard with joy the last hurrah." from their victorious comrades say that they had waged successful war. And so in that part of the poem, then you get this other kind of um, use of blood, right? So it's, you have the, certainly the blood of the enslaved, the blood of, you know, you think of, of chains rubbing people raw, you think of, of, of whips and enslaved people bleeding. But here you also have the blood of patriots and you have the blood of black people and white people together. That is, that is sunken into the soil, right? And throughout the poem, he goes back and he uses this, um, these um, kind of geographic words. That's what I grabbed from it. He uses um, hill and plain and vale and crag and brook and um, inland lake and dark green wood. And in that, it reminded me, I was thinking of the I Have a Dream speech when King like goes from like, geographical feature to mountains, to mountains, so that this poem is about the land, but it's also about the land itself, right? And how do you, how are you both of a land, right? Grown up from a land, but somehow told that you are not of that land. So that's, again, just really um, fascinating to me in this, you know, continuous um, use of like patriotic blood. It's a very bloody poem. Right, there's blood everywhere. Like everybody's bleeding, right? Um, and he says, this, you know, this patriotic blood was freely shed. Like, yeah, I'll bleed for America if y'all gonna do the right thing, right? But then when the souls come back, they say, oh, is this what we shed our blood for? Right? Is is the question? So that's interesting to me. Um, the second thing, two two of three, is one is um, the ways he characterizes enslavement. And that's really important if you have people, so if you're saying, who have never seen a plantation, 
right? Or they might not have any um, idea in their mind of what enslavement looks like. Um, and what I love about this poem is he actually talks about what it sounds like. Um, and so he has lines in here about the shriek of virgin purity, um, the cry of fathers, mothers, wives, severed from all their hearts hold dear, hold dear the indignant wail of fiery youth. Um, so you can, he said, the cry of helpless infancy torn from the parents' fond caress. Right. So again, he uses these um, these images. I don't know if it's an image, right? But these sounds, right? So you can get a sense of this is what it sounds like. So as you're sitting and you're reading and you're hearing these words, and it's left up to your imagination what this must be like. And you might not know what it looks like, right? But you know what a baby sounds like, right? And so the person who's reading is, is listening, um, listening for this. Um, so for him, abolition is certainly patriotic, right? And that's certainly, I think, how, how it ends. Um, uh, he gives us a, a soundscape of enslavement here with the voices, um, the cries, um, which I think goes alongside those earlier cries and the hurrahs of the soldiers who are so happy and like, oh my God, like freedom, yes, it's so great. Um, the extent of whether you believe in the Constitution, I'll leave that up to you. But for the sake of the poem, right, it, it's very much about um, patriots with these good hearts doing, doing good work. And finally, um, I'm interested in how he characterizes the enslaved people. So yes, there is a lot of anger, right? He says, to thee I raise my song. You know, it starts out, you know, in, in this very kind of charged language. But then he also depicts enslaved people, one as patriots, right? As lovers of their country, but as lovers of their families, right? Lovers of, of God. Um, and so there is also a softness to the enslaved that comes through in this poem. And that's a really important, um, and as I teach students now about enslavement, that that's a really hard thing to do, right? It's, it's hard to take a group of people, um, enslaved black people, that again, you might, a reader might not have a lot of familiarity with, right? But they might know um, pictures, they certainly might know pro-slavery propaganda, they might know um, they might know what Jefferson wrote. They might know all of that. Like so, these that these black people are bestial. They have no art. Um, they are, you know, you can do whatever you want to do with them. They don't grieve. They don't do anything like that. But to depict them here as having hearts that can be hurt, right? Um, as hopeful people, even in anger, right? Even after all this time has passed, to still be trying to hold on to their children, to still try to have, as he, um, he says, um, the indignant wail of fiery youth, its noble aspirations crushed, to still be individuals, still be people with aspirations and with dreams, right? But that's a really difficult thing to do. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about this poem and why he should be read in conversation with people like Douglas, but certainly poets like Francis Harper, um, other writers like Harriet Jacobs, um, Benjamin Banneker is in this book, which I think is a math problem that's in the poem, which is really kind of fun. I don't know the math problem, but hopefully someone does. Um, but this sense of these people, despite it all, are still striving to embrace one another. And yes, you know, there are certainly the, the big heroes, the big heroic stories, but you also have stories of parents and relatives and people who are trying to um, have some sense of self, some sense of, of personhood. And again, I think that's an incredibly difficult and tricky thing to do because what you have to do, and this is why I love this period of literature so much, is you have to, these writers have to break the racial identification of the white reader, the white abolitionist reader with the white slaver. And you have to get, they have to get white readers to empathize with black people. And that's really difficult. So when everything in your culture is telling you they are different from you, whether you believe that enslavement should be over or not, but they are fundamentally different from you, 
this poem, but at the, the heart of it says we share this land together, right? You can't separate the white blood from the black blood, right, that has, that has been shed. But also, when you look at our aspirations, when you look at our hearts, when you look at our hopes, our shared vision for this country, you can't get there without them, right? And they can't get there without you, right? And so again, I think that's, for me, is the real power um, of this poem. And to title it America and have that be the vision um, that, you know, as you say, when the Civil War comes, like something's gonna happen, something has to happen, right? And they said, we can either do it the, the easy way, or we can do it the not, the not so easy way. But again, this theme of asking America, to, asking America to be America, but also asking readers to do something, right? Which is why I love books so much, right? Telling you, yes, read it, but then put it down and then go do something. Your heart's been changed, you've been moved by these words, so what are you gonna do with them now? Right? Again, that, again, it's such a, an incredible thing for me to think about these early black writers like doing this when in so many places it was still illegal to learn how to read and write. Right? You didn't have tons of schools and tons of teachers just yet. So I'll end with this, that there's a, a spark of, um, of hope that I think he puts here, both I think in, in terms of these like political, um, social aspects, but also I think in just the power of poetry um, to move people um, and to move readers and to get us here 200 years you know, after his birth, all these years after this poem is written, and it's still speaking to us, right? And so I hope that we, you know, return to it, you know, again and again, like I said, you know, share it with a friend, you know, it's National Poetry Month, like put it in your pocket, like walk around and be like, hey, here's this poem that, that I heard about, right? Support the young poets in your own lives who are writing things, who knows, you might be sitting here 100 years from now, and up, you, your name might be in one of those, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, so that's that's what we that's what we want. So that's all I have to say um, about about the poem. So thank you for listening. So in in uh, James Monroe Whitfield, we had somebody who wrote and then got out and did stuff, yes. and we're very happy that he got out of his cellar, aren't we? Thank you all for coming. There's more to come in the next hour. Thank you. Thank you.